usually with tears. It also means to call loudly, to shout, to yell, to give forth vocal sounds or characteristics call. And as you know, there are different kinds of cries. Any parent knows that when you have children, they have the, the whiny cry when they really want something and you know they know that they're not supposed to have it, but yet they whine and complain because that's what they really want. And we know that there's also the cry of attention where someone just wants attention, so they'll act out in a certain way or yell to grab somebody's attention. But there's a cry this morning that God cannot ignore. See, the whiny cries God doesn't pay attention to, but there's a particular cry that causes the Lord himself to move. And that's the cry, the kind of cry that Israel uttered. We know the story very well. We've, we've been studying, especially New Congress class, of how the children of Israel slowly but surely were taken captives by Egypt. It didn't happen all of a sudden, but it was a slow takeover, as we talked about, to the point where the children of Israel didn't even realize that they were being controlled by their enemy. But when they did realize, Israel started to cry. They started to cry out by reason of their taskmasters. Right. They started to cry by reason of the ones that were uh, pushing the, the uh, putting the pressure on them and, and causing them to work, causing them to be in bondage, causing them to be in a situation where they could not escape themselves. They were bound. They had no help. They were hopeless, almost, except for the fact that they remember the story of their God. They remember the story of how the Lord had uh, promoted their ancestor Joseph to such a position in Egypt. And they began to cry out to this God. But this cry was not any ordinary cry. It wasn't the whining cry, but it was a cry of desperation. You see, when you get in a situation when you are desperate, you throw all the decorum aside. You don't care who's looking at you. You don't care how you sound. You don't care. Sometimes you don't even know what's coming out of your mouth, but you just know that you need attention. You need to grab somebody's attention. You somebody to help you. I remember a couple uh, many years ago now when my brother, we were I was home visiting this when I was working in New York and I was home visiting for a little bit. And I remember my brother, it was a Sunday morning, we were all getting ready for church in the house and, and my brother was downstairs playing and a friend over the two of them were wrestling as boys often do. And I remember we were getting ready and then all of a sudden we heard this shriek in the house. Now, it wasn't any ordinary shriek, but it was a, 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 a cry that went straight to your heart because all of a sudden you knew something was wrong. And I remember my mom being all the way upstairs and I was, she has a split level house and I was in the next level. And we all rushed downstairs. And then we saw my brother reeking in pain. He was on the ground. I've never seen him just, he was crying out. And, and you know, like we said, there's different kinds of cry, but when you hear that cry of desperation, you know something is wrong. And when we heard that cry, we rushed to his aid. We rushed because we knew something was wrong. That's the same kind of cry that Israel had. And because the Lord is faithful and because he loves Israel, he came to the rescue. The Lord says, I have heard their cries. And he said, I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of the land. But not just to bring them out. Not just to bring them out of destruction, not just to bring them out of Egypt, but to bring them unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, and unto a land that right now may be inhabited by others, but they're going to take possession of this land. The Lord was coming to deliver his people because his people were crying out in bondage. But what you need to understand is the Lord knew that they were going to be in bondage. For some 430 years earlier, the Lord allowed a deep sleep to come onto Abraham. And when Abraham was entrusted, entrusted in this deep sleep, he saw a vision that frightened him. And the Lord gave the understanding. He said, listen, your children are going to be in bondage. Your children are going to be enslaved for 430 years. They're going to be in a situation of desperation. They're going to be in a land that's not theirs. They're not going to have control over their own selves, but they're going to be in bondage. But there's going to come a point that they're going to cry. They're going to recognize the situation in which they are in. And they're going to cry out. And when they cry out, when in that place of desperation they cry out to me, then will I deliver. Then will I set them free. Then will I bring them to this place. See, the thing is, even though Israel was in this place of desperation, it was the Lord that put them in this position. It was the Lord who put them in this position of desperation. Because there are things that the Lord wanted to give to Israel.
Joshua says in person when you see uh, what the Lord says to Abraham, he said, I'm going to give them great riches by these Egyptians. I'm going to give them all the wealth and everything they need to be able to go into the promised land. But first they've got to get into Egypt. First they've got to be in the state. And then when they cry out, I will deliver them. Church, what we need to understand is that, and we know it already, but when we see how it's all laid out, the situation that we are in, the Lord has designed it specifically for us. When Evangelist Kahuna was here, he, he gave us a beautiful illustration about how our trials are just for us. How our trials, our situations, our, our storm that we go through is specifically for us. But church, what I'm here to tell you this morning is that the trial is not for no reason, but the trial is designed to elicit a response. Yes. The trial is specifically tailored to you to elicit a response. The same things that cause you to cry out may not cause me to cry out. The same situations that make me realize, my God, I'm so lost, I'm desperate for you, Lord, I need you, are not the same situations that are going to elicit that response from you. So the situation is tailored specifically to us to be able to elicit that response. And the reason is, and Pastor said, I thought he was going to preach out the whole message while he was here. The reason is, your cry is a kind of praise. When you cry out, and I'm not talking about the whining cry, we're, we're talking about that desperate cry. See, when you really get into a situation, when you are desperate and you have no options left, you, you'll do anything. If someone comes to you and say, listen, tap your head three times and run yourself at the same time and jump up and down, you'll be healed. When you're so desperate, when you try everything else, you're willing to do it. You know, that woman with the issue of blood, she heard that, you know, this, this Jesus had done great miracles. She was so desperate. She's like, you know what, if I can, I don't, know, I don't even need to talk to him. I'm so desperate. If I can even just touch the hem of his garment, then maybe I can get what I need. Maybe I can get the healing that I'm so desperate in need of. When you are desperate, you cry out from a depth in your soul that words can't even match. And you come with a desperation. You come with a shrill cry from your spirit that moves the very mighty God to your side. But don't get it twisted. It's not because we're righteous. It's not because we're so good. It's not because of who we are. For the Bible says even of Ahab that he was the most wicked of the kings of Israel. They said, listen, you thought you were bad? They said, no one is worse than Ahab. He said, as much as his fathers had done wrong, as much as they had perverted the gospel, as much as they had come and, and, and twisted the minds of Israel, no one was worse than Ahab. And they said, if it wasn't bad enough that he did all these wicked things, he had the nerve and the gall to take a wife of a, of, a, of, a, of a pagan land. He had the nerve when the Lord said not to mix with other lands. He had the nerve as the king to take this old, old Jezebel and take him as his wife and become one with this devil. But even wicked Ahab, even evil Ahab and all his wrongdoing and everything that he did, when he cried a desperate cry, when he cried a cry of sincerity and repentance, the Lord was moved to say, you see Elijah, you see this Ahab? Even with all this wickedness, he, all this punishment, the wickedness that I, I promised for his family, he's not going to see it. It's not going to come in his day. Why? Because Ahab, even in all this wickedness, he recognized when that judgment came forth, he recognized his frailty. He recognized that there was a problem that he could not fix. And he was sorrowed by it. He did not turn from his wicked ways, and that's the difference. But he cried, and the Lord preserved him from seeing this evil that he promised. When we cry out with that desperate cry, we cause the mighty God to move and to come and deliver us out of our situation. Because when we cry, we are praising him. For praise is a giving of accolades to one who is worthy of it. That's Praise right. is according accolades or according worth to one who has deserved it. Yes. And so when in the midst of our situation, in the midst of our desperation, when we cry out, we're saying, Lord, I can't do this. We're saying, Lord, I'm not able, but you are. Yes. We're saying, Lord, I've got a desperate need. I don't know where else to turn, but Lord, you are the only one who is able. For you are great and you are mighty and you are able to resolve this situation. We're saying that, Lord, there's nothing that you cannot do. You know, the, uh, the blind Bartimaeus, when he was sitting on the side of the road, he was desperate. You see, he was tired of being blind. He was tired of being in a situation. He was tired of not 
being able to see. I wish all of us would get tired of not being able to see in the spirit what the Lord is desiring to do in us. But when we get to a place when we're tired of our state, when we get to a place when we're sick and tired, not just tired, but we're just, we're done. We, we say that song, I'm, I'm, I'm tired, I'm worn. When we get to a place when we are in our spirit just worn out out of the situation, it causes us to cry out. Just like Bon Bartimaeus said, me cry, said, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And when all the critics came and said, Barton, shut up, take Jesus, that's how time for you. He said, listen, people are talking, you know what? So I'm going to cry loud or something. I cry to descend over the crowd. And he said, Jesus. that big girls and big boys don't cry. We've been conditioned by society that, you know what, you just need to be tough and bear it. You just need to take it like a man, or you just need to take it like a woman and not, not cry because crying is a sign of weakness. And in that much, the skeptics are right. Crying is a sign of weakness. But my Bible tells me that when I am weak, then he is strong. to him. 